Do I? <laughs> oh. So we can be recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So can can everybody else? I'm going to mute everybody else now. Nicola, you're going to have to unmute yourself when I mute everybody. Okay. Wait a minute. There we go. Right. You're all muted now. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I can now say hello, everybody, which is very nice. So, um, okay. So my, this is the title that I'm talking to, which is 2020 vision, 21st century Pythagorean. And I've uh, noted that Theano is in the Pythagorean mathematics and 2020 astronomology. And this talk, I, I decided to call it um, a fruitcake because uh, I, <laughs> Mark suggested I, I do a talk. I hadn't been thinking about giving a presentation because I like you, Doug, I am working on a book. I've also got two papers to complete for the proceedings. So I hadn't really thought about the presentation. And then Mark said, how about um, you're yeah, doing one? He, he liked the idea of me doing something on the astrology, which I shared on Amper Chat. And I said, well, I thought lots of people probably didn't relate to that. And he thought it would be nice to have something esoteric at the end of the week. Um, so, but in order to do that, I knew that I would have to speak about Pythagorean mathematics. And because it's basically, uh, yeah, I think Pythagorean mathematics could be seen as encompassing the quadrivium, which is as you uh, all probably know, or maybe don't anyway, is part of the liberal arts. So there were seven liberal arts, which are the trivium, which is grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, which are the, the mathematics of the verbal arts, and the quadrivium of the mathematical arts. And those are number, space or geometry, music and astronomy. So the, and the astronomy includes astrology. So as now, these days we have astronomy or astrology. And so I decided to say astronomology, astronomology. Is that how I'm pronouncing it? I think so. Astronomology. Astronomology, that's how I'm pronouncing it. Astronomology. And so I will come to that. And what I will be doing is looking at relationships with, between planets, because those are very clear astronomical facts. Whereas the constellations are, are more um, controversial. So there's a in astrology, they use a tropical zodiac, which goes back to the Ptolemaic signs. Um, in Vedic astrology, they use the astronomical zodiac because of the procession of the equinoxes, obviously, things have moved. And uh, so that's what you get in Vedic astrology. Even, even if you agree on working with the constellations as they are, there is that problem of, well, are you looking at the whole length of the constellations or are you doing a standardized 30, de 30 degree each because there are 12 constellations? So I'm avoiding all of that. So when I come to talk about the extraordinary situation of 2020 in terms of the astronomy and the questions of the possible meaning of that, I am talking about um, the, just, yeah, just, the, just the planets and the relationships between the planets. Uh, so I will say something. So for those, for those of you who were at Pampa last year, uh, 
you will know a lot of what I'm going to say about Pythagorean mathematics. Um, also, I'm not sure, I didn't see, I did invite some members of my, of not my, Sylvia's and my Sacred Mathematics Research Group, but I haven't seen any of those here because they would also know quite a lot of what I'm going to say. And obviously some of you, quite a lot of you know anyway, just from private conversations. But there are people who are not in any of those categories. <laughs> so I'm just going to do a very basic look at uh, Pythagorean mathematics. Um, yeah, from the sixth century BC. And uh, the, main, the main thing to be aware of is the meanings. So it's tamathemata, those things which have been learned, and philosophia or philosophy, which means the wisdom of love. And uh, the Pythagoreans were, the, the, the term mathematics was coined by Pythagoras or in the Pythagorean brew. And as I say, it means those things which have been learned. And what needs to be understood is that it's the philosophy comes first. They were a community. They were a community of men and women. This is very important uh, that this is one actually sees already by the time of Plato, there is a falling away from the, the core alignment with the divine, with, with divine principles. Um, e even though obviously the, in Plato there is a lot of good stuff, etc., etc. <laughs> Interesting stuff. But you, I think you probably know that, that Plato um, dissed women. <laughs> Uh, that's not a good start to uh, dis half human race. It's, you know, the, the fact of slavery is another issue um, as well. But anyways, but, but, but yeah, I mean, well, anyway, so the, Pyth so the Pythagoreans were a community that were, they were a spiritual community. And it's very interesting as well. So, yeah, so the philosophy of the, 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 the true original meaning being the wisdom of love, it's, it's fairly clear, really, when we look at all of our portmanteau Greek words, which were also portmanteau Greek words. I mean, we've made some up um, afterwards. We've used that technique. But there were you know, things like geographia or geometria. The, the one that comes first is the one of which the second term uh, is related to. So the, the geometria, the metria, the measure is of the earth. The graphia, the geographia, the graphia is the description of the earth. Philosophia is the sophia, the wisdom of the philia, the love. And so, and that, and it's also very, very interesting. And I, I have not seen this, I have, there is um, there's a lovely uh, chap called Peter Kingsley, whom you may know, who's who is a a, a, a mystic and a very very um, proficient. Sorry about that. Sounds off. Um, Greek scholar, uh, but even he, I haven't seen him talk about this, about the, yeah, the, 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 the true meaning of philosophy and uh, something, oh, I know, yeah, the fact that the philia is, a lot, is friendship. So the three main Greek words for love were philia, which was friendship, agape, which is love of the divine, and eros, which is the sexual love. And in 
in the Plato's discourse on love, it's about eros. It's very, very interesting. Um, so, but it, but it's also very, very interesting that it's not that it that it's not agapasophenia. So it, it's not actually that you know the the, the 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 name there is not speaking of the divine. It's talking about human love and uh, love between humans. And actually, I think I've, I've written I've written about this. In one of them, either in the beauty of mathematics, mathematics of beauty, or in the 21st century Pythagorean mathematics, so it, it will be in the proceedings. So I, I, I won't go more into that now because I want to keep going. Um, so yes, yeah, so, but I need to, to just to, to, to point out. So the thing is that obviously, you know, from the Pythagorean community. You know, it, it was it was the beginning of, of our mathematics, and the Tama Themata is those things which have been learned. It was not just the technical mathematics. It wasn't just abstract learning. It wasn't. <laughs> do you know your times tables, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It it was actually what comes out of the wisdom of love. So this is the, that is the motivation. And of course, it, the desire that when we love, we desire to know the other. And the Pythagoreans were respectful of each other and they were also respectful of nature and a desire to know these other beings. Well, as you know, they were they they believed in the in in um, metempsychosis and uh, so reincarnation, and so of course they various. Well, the, I mean, it, in Greek, suche is both means both soul and butterfly. So it's. Uh, yeah, butterflies, wonderful beings. Uh, so anyway, so that's so the, the uh, and this is why the why it was an esoteric group. And oh goodness, I'm I'm explaining. Yeah, I need okay. So it was an esoteric group. We have the term esoteric, meaning spiritual, mystical, etc. The reason is that was the the the, the name of the inner in, in greek it now has both mean it has the meaning inner inside and the, the meaning spiritual and mystical, and mystical. Uh, because but, but in the Pythag pythagorean group it was just the inner group the inner circle who did the mathematics or they were also they were either called the esoteric or the mathematic uh, because they were when you first came, you were one of the outside group, the exoteric, and then when you'd show, so you basically hung around to show that you really were serious, and then you could come in and you could listen, and then you were one of the acousmatic, the, the listeners, the listening ones. And uh, this is important as well, that it was listeners rather than observers. And this, uh, so this I'll, I'll take me into the, 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 what's happened when the, the Pythagorean group was broken up, it was seen as dangerous politically to the local uh, tyrant, the, you know, there were the city states at that time. And uh, when that happened, then the, 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 works, the work, the technical work began to get out. <clears throat> Before that, it was held within that group. The reason it was held within that inner group was that they were the, the what they were learning, what they were developing was wisdom of love. And so that responsibility, Pythagoras knew that this knowledge, this technical mathematical knowledge, could be used for good or evil. 
And as such, he didn't want it to be used for evil. So the people who were developing it had to develop the, the moral responsibility to only use it in those ways. When, when, when it was broken, but well, we, we, we have since then, we've basically been living increasingly in a world of a sorcerer's apprentice. And uh, ooh, that's what we're looking at big time now, as, as I think everybody knows. Um, anyway, so the, the technical side that is what came out, and the, the qualitative side, so it was the quantitative technical side is what was followed. The qualitative side was not, and it was actually, interestingly, the way we see it, it's gone. So in terms of 21st century Pythagorean mathematics, what some of us are attempting to do is to bring back those complementaries. So um, whereas now mathematics is, is predominantly quantitative, visual, technical abstract material, um, we are working to bring back the complementary sides, which is the qualitative, the musical, and the spiritual. And of course, this, this side is, leads to mechanical ideas, and this side promotes human living, becoming. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just, a, a quick aside, now I'll put this down, um, that I, I've, I've long <laughs> said that, 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 um, that, that I'm in alpha for the mathematics and I, uh, <laughs> I actually, I, I emailed Lou the other day, I was saying I've got this question about, um, you know, which, what, which ones of us were in the uh, Pythagorean school together and, um, and some of you think I'm joking and some of you know that I'm serious. So um, anyway, but it's, I do see that, I mean, the, the point about AMPA is that, you know, we are all doing this for love, from love. That's where we're all coming from. Because it, precisely because the kind of work that we're doing here, it has been outcast from standard academia. And um, so, yeah, so, so uh, and, I, and, and it is, and I do think it is an extraordinary group and we see an extraordinary variety of work. I think that we, and we've seen this over the years and at different years, different times, different things have been stronger. And um, I'm really, really pleased to, to see you come in, John Torday, because and we had a, there was a lovely chap, Stephen Wood, a, a biologist, and but he's been doing other things. He's he's younger, and and I think life has been a bit struggling. So, um, but yes, yeah, so it's very very important. But I, I, yes, yeah, so I just just wanted to, to name it. You see, so for me, Peter Peter Rollins, this is your your it's the mathematics of your work that's more important to me as Pythagorean mathematics. It's very very beautiful. And of course, you know, Vanessa as well, although uh, you've been out of Ampa for a bit. Uh, and of course, Lou's work as well, Grenville's. Uh, there's, oh, and I want to mention as well, Francoise Chaitin Chatelain. I really just want, I want to put her on the map because a lot of you will not have heard of her. And she wanted, she would have come, she sadly passed away across the threshold in May of this year and I had intended to get out to see her in France in April but we had this the situation that we had and so it wasn't possible. Um, John Ampson and I have been working with her since uh, last year, well actually probably yeah at the end of 2018 in fact and uh, She's been working within, she's a computer scientist. Uh, she's got a big fat book called Qualitative Computing. And she was working on another book. And uh, she, there will be a paper of hers in the proceedings. 
and her work is very, very exciting because it's actually um, looking at possible creativity through uncertainty. Uh, she goes into the Dixon algebra, so going from, you know, you said from quaternions into octonions, the dead, blah, 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 uh, and has this very in interesting interpretation. So this is, this is anyway, so that, that's an aside. So Pythagorean mathematics, anything more that I need to say about that as such? I know, let's have a look. So I've got all these bits of paper. So I think what I wanted to do Oh, I know that was it. One thing was, um, yeah, so some things I've managed to do cards for and some things I haven't. So here we go. So the, the sixth century Pythagorean mathematics didn't include change in the basic reality, whereas now we can uh, and need to. Yeah, and uh, yes, I. As I've said here, it's process, it's growing, not just mechanical change. Um, now, I want, the other thing I need to do is to tell you here my, um, my, my hierarchy of levels, which I see as a, a Pythagorean one. And this is that uh, there's reality which is greater than awareness, which includes awareness and is greater than and includes consciousness, which is greater than and includes language and is greater than, includes reason, which is greater than and includes logic. Um, and I realise, I feel a bit strange because when normally when I do a presentation, I have something um, you know, I, I like people to do things rather than just sit down. Um, I kind of, you know, I say maybe, maybe you know, stand up and jump around a bit. But I mean, because I, I usually have an exercise, uh, which is obviously related to the topic, but I haven't, I, I didn't think of something that could be done in this sort of situation. Um, so, yeah, so, so I haven't got that. So, uh, anyway, so. So I'm going to talk. I, I, I feel myself talking very fast and just talking, and I really you're, you're doing fine. Do you want us to interact with you at all? Not, not yet. You see, because because otherwise, if if so, because I really want to get various things done. I, I want to. I think maybe I will just talk fast now, which is which is kind of like not really what I like doing, but just to get get over various points that I want to bring up, so that we can then talk. You know, we can see what grabs different people from what I'm saying. So it, if hopefully you're all okay with that. Um, so let's have a look. So I will do that. So let's see. That's my hierarchy of awareness, um, and I went from there. Oh, that's right. So, so I just to say so. So um, yeah. So so reality, in my sense, is the great wholeness of which we are part. God, the ineffable, the great oneness, the monos. We can do various names. Now. Uh, Okay, yeah, if anybody chats, for some reason, I don't get any questions. I, like, sometimes I do, I used to get them kind of coming up at the side of the screen so I could see, but, but I'm not having that now. Anyway, so that's, yeah, so in terms of this hierarchy, that, so that's reality which would include, you know, the realities that you were speaking of, Pete, and also John Hyatt, I don't know if you're here today, um, that you were talking about Whitehead Ian, uh, reality as event as process it includes that it's, it's the great the great wholeness now so then by awareness i'm talking I've, I've written some things which are tricky so here i've just put what have i put human heterogeneous openness sensory and extrasensory and uh, as i said this is a a yearning description a la whitehead because uh, I'm, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think of Whitehead as being quite Pythagorean, although he, I mean, he, 
I think you know you probably have seen himself more as a Platonist. Um, and so that's in terms of descriptions rather than definitions. I mean, definitions have, a, have definite places where it's a good idea to, have, to go for definitions, but they're always temporary. And there are places where d descriptions are the best we can do and maybe are, are better than definitions in places. Anyway, so, that, so that's awareness and then consciousness because a lot of people have spoken about consciousness, so I just needed to, to <laughs> come up with this slightly controversial statement. Consciousness kills <laughs> um, because it's not awareness. So, and, and because consciousness, consciousness stops the process, uh, takes snapshots. And I, I, that's the situation. Oh, it takes something, snap, shot, bang, bang. Um, and makes maps, and it's important. We we need um, for incarnate survival and social communication, and uh, because we are social beings. But communication is not communion, and uh, yeah, there's more to say about snapshots and making movies and how they. Are then fantasies, which is not imaginals, and then uh, in awareness we are reborn. And I know that a lot of you are very, very keen on uh, George Spencer Brown, and uh, and most of you know that I'm basically not that keen on George Spencer Brown. But in the preface to Laws of the Form. That he, he redeemed himself because he says the, the more humankind has elevated consciousness over awareness, the stupider it has become. And I think that's really great. And oh, oh yes, yeah, so and, and then I added this the thing about um, we've elevated experiment, which is repeatable over experience, which is our lives, is living. And uh, I'm not going to sing in Christ's I don't know. If I put you on you, I would. Um, okay. So. Now, so that's consciousness. And then we're going to language, reason, logic. So I think um, I didn't open, I didn't write anything for those. What I want to do um is to talk about different kinds of knowing really i want to talk about different kinds of knowing because i think what i really want to do is to look at where we are going now and uh i think i've i've, I've taken much too much time for the pythagorean stuff really but anyway it needed to be. So I need to say, I need to look at the watershed of the 17th century, which is when there was the introduction of the sign for zero. And uh, this was initially for the empty place in the abacus calculus, or calculations, and it, it revolutionized mathematics, as probably most of you, a lot of you know, because then we had the Hindu Arabic numerals, which were a decimal place system. And instead of the Roman numerals, we could calculate much, much quicker. Um, this, so this, uh, but the, the point is that when this symbol came in, it was not, the, the whole kind of philosophy of it was not looked at and there is a whole thing which is maybe not the main thing I want to go into. I, I think I think there's a whole, you know, I mean, I think it was Doug who was saying we could have a com conversation sessions and, and I, I had a little email with Enrico and Lou and saying maybe uh, this whole thing like zero 
zero, naught, nothing, no thingness are all different and no thingness relates to the implicate order and and I think there's um I think it's very very important just actually you know because 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 like you guys are all just talking about nothing 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 and and I I'm not sure I don't really yeah I just really think <laughs> I, I just like to have a set but I, in a way I don't really want to do that today um but I think I think it would be a very good thing to, to, to go into that what I I, I would I want to just to talk about the different kinds of knowing. Uh, so again, you know, science comes from skira, sapere, and but there's also conoscere and conectra, you know, which is getting to know you. So there's science is knowing about things, and conoscere is getting to know beings, and Clearly, um, it's been very, you know, it's, it, 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 it's good to know. We have, it's, for, it's from this watershed of the 17th century, the whole knowing about things expanded hugely. And it was all, it was under the aegis of the, the Baconian dictum um, of, you know, knowledge is power, and that power was power over nature. And as we know, Francis Bacon had very good intentions, and we've seen repeatedly in the hundred, the centuries that have gone on since then, people with very good intentions thinking, believing, um, as David Bohm said he did as well when he came into science. If, oh, you know, science was the way to make a better world, make a happier world. Uh, it would make things possible. You know, it, and what we've seen is it hasn't worked like that. And it's because of the ideology underneath. Because what we've seen is increasingly the rich have got richer, the poor have got poorer. And this is what we continue to see. And, it, and it's, it's, it's this power over. Now, I'm interested in a, a Buberian epistemology. So Buber's book is called I and Thou. And he talks about when we, are when we live in a second person way then we are living it's that that's living because we are recognizing the livingness of this wonderful amazing universe of which we're part and then we meet different beings so we can meet each other which we often don't do even when we're meeting, we often don't really meet each other. Uh, but when we do, things happen, we change, it's the experience, that's the living. But when we live in the third person, then we make everything into things. And that's what consciousness does. And it has its place, and science as such has its place, but it is time to reverse and, and I think most of you know, I did write them down, but I, I'll just say them. But I think most of you know some of my favorite quotes. There's C.S. Lewis quote, um, everybody wants progress, but if we're going in the wrong direction, the person who turns around first is the most progressive. And then there are a couple of T.S. Eliot quotes. And one is, how much knowledge have we lost through gaining the information? And how much wisdom have we lost through gaining knowledge? And he also said, humankind cannot bear very much reality. And that's, um, that's the, the reality of the ineffable. Um, 
it, and so I wrote that, which is uh, it's a, a great Rilke quote. Um, I've forgotten how to, I, I'll leave it. It's really the, the, the punchline is every angel is terrible. Fear not. Um, so, so, the, so then, so the thing is now, in terms of the, the, the book that I'm working on, John, uh, no, Doug rather, is um, the, the, the long title is Mathematics and Morality, Refining Awareness, Deepening Love. And that's been calling me even longer than, than you, you've been working on yours. And uh, there'll, there'll be a snappy title. But, 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 so this is, this is where I'm tr trying to go with this quickly is, is, is to the, import, the importance of bringing back this, uh, this sense of responsibility, this, uh, the, the morality, which is in the mathematics as well. And that's, it's to do with how we teach mathematics. Uh, anyway, so that, yeah. Uh, so that, yes, yeah, so that's, so, so I think that, what I, did, I don't know, I showed that. So why do we desire to know? It's important that we look at our motivation, uh, our intent, and the desire to control now is obsolete, and in fact, obscene. Uh, now, another thing I put here, so I'm just kind of like trying to skip quick. Oh golly, and, and I will just, and I will very, very quickly do the other. So, but I, I think I want to come to is um, in terms of the Pythagorean mathematics, and this I am more interested in discussing, but again, it could be a separate topic, is sign and symbol. And you know, sign is a one-to-one -one correspondence, symbol is a one-to-many correspondence. And what I'm saying is that since the 17th century, we've been increasingly enchanted by the symbolic language and of quantitative mathematics, basically. Um, and this, and then, it, oh, well, okay, I, 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 I do really send you right more about this. Um, now, there's, there's another one. Now, um, it's another thing that I want to go explanations of stories. This is another thing, maybe a topic. But I, there was something that's occurred to me recently, and I just want to bring it up now because, again, it's something. I'm, I would be interested in talking, looking at now because I just think it's very, very interesting. Um, so it's the idea that meaning has momentum. And I'm pointing out that energy is a, is a scalar and the derivation, the etymology is in work. And it, I'm looking because I can't remember what I wrote, so the importance in science covers, yeah. So, yeah, so energy was key in science as it developed more and more to be used in you know, the capitalist industrial revolution, which through which people gave up their lives. I mean, more and more people were, were taken from the farms where they had, or, or, yeah, from the land where they actually had more freedom. And it was, and it was the institution of clock time is what we saw. So there's, there's a whole cultural thing that I need to, to write sometimes. So I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Now then, so um, let's, so I don't think, did I show that at the beginning, the arithmology, um, which is, Again, yeah, no, I talked about astronom astronomology. So arithmology, arithmos is the, the Greek word for integer. And I think we need to develop this. It's between number theory and numerology and, and includes both. And, and, that, and I found out this very interesting thing in terms of the etymology of understand, uh, which is that that under in old English is um, was under, but it was also between or amongst. So it's 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 got that um, cohesive 
uh, more communion type feeling whereas epistemology is actually it comes from standing over the uh, epi is over as i'm sure starte is standing is greek again okay so let, okay so, be, so so now because this is this was this is this is on the program so the so the 2020 vision okay so the arithmology of it um is to do with going from the second to the third millennium and it's uh so in the first in in the second millennium the the first the first number it was like 1000 to 1 to, to 1999 right now it that saw and that that was ad now that saw in christendom because that's as far as the calendar reached at that time where well, i mean it increasingly in obviously as we came into the 20th century then with global capitalism that became a global calendar ad became a global calendar even though there are muslim and hindu and other calendars in or chinese calendar, they, they, those exist but there is a global calendar now which is from global capitalism um so uh yeah so but so in that first moment in christendom in that second millennium we have one at the beginning and it's the growth we see the growth of the individual in the, the middle it, which is in the renaissance is uh i was going to get i've got somewhere i've got the cassira i was going to show various books like well, i showed but i showed the peter kingsley yeah so the the notion of the individual in renaissance philosophy um it's probably not cassira. anyway so uh that we yeah, are that is before that you know so like in the early part in the in the middle age of what's called the dark ages and then into the middle ages what we see is coming out of feudalism where people didn't in christendom where people did not have an individual life and it was that was the development now so and but in that there's the beginning of that, that first, that, that individual, that one, is one in relation to other. So it's, it's, it's the second millennium, it's in relation to two. So there, is this, uh, uh, there are new relationships of two-ness. But what we, so what we see that there was but individuation, but bigger was individualism. And we, you know, we see that you know, sort of like in the way that nation states go, but also, you know, within global capitalism, you know, the, the egotism is um, quite scary, extraordinary. Anyway, so now we're going to the third millennium. So in terms of this arithmological view that I'm, I'm thinking of, we could say, yeah, we, we we're in this tunis. Um, there is that you know everybody you know every, you know everybody knows that you know i'm an individual you're different i'm you know and in fact of course obviously we've got all these different meditations for people to actually experience the oneness again etc et um but uh so we've got that two-ness um what and, and but it's the third millennium so what i'm what my belief is that what humanity could be reaching for in this is the third which is the whole which contains the two or or you know what is in between which which we you know, the relationship which is of course this is where some of the mathematics come anyway that's another whole exciting thing um and to do with numbers levels of numbers that the numbers so when we talk about qualities of numbers we're seeing numbers as levels not uh you know not just um masses of lots of you know lots of ones <laughs> i've got a hundred ones i've got a hundred ones but but going from two to three a whole different levels of things yeah okay what a lot of us know about and it's very exciting and so okay so 
that's my airport. So, and then, so I look at the 2020 vision was to do with that, which was to do with the fact that we, act, we, we see, it's very bizarre. 2001, we had the war on terror um, began. And then we had 2008, 2009, we had the great bankers robbery. And then 2019, we've had the war on Corona. So we've had three global phenomena which are all accentuating two as oppositions. Uh, enough said because I'll, I'll get on to the astronaut. <laughs> so, and, and, oh, that's what, no, but I did, I had a nice thing I was going to say about that. So, and so, so these are all kind of global, ghastly things because Tunis as opposition is ghastly, war is ghastly. Um, and of course, we can see twos as complementaries. Uh, and that, so, that's, so that's, again, this, this question of where are we going? And the more we can base ourselves in the Pythagorean philosophy, the wisdom of love, the more that we can hopefully find, co-create ways through this. And uh, I just I want to show a lovely quote because uh, obviously there's quite a lot of apocalyptic thinking going on, but there's also a lovely quote from Patanjali, who's the great, 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 great grandfather of, of yoga, and it's uh, in Sanskrit, it's heyam uh, dukham anagatam, and that means the, the, the evil that has not happened is avoidable. May it be so. Okay, so I've got five minutes to do this astronomical overview. So here, or astro astronomical, oh, well look, so it's to do with, so I've put, I put together in, like in January, then, then June, July, and then November, December. So, so, the, so, so it, this is an extraordinary year. This is such an extraordinary year. In, in terms of patterning. And it starts 10 days in with the January 10th, 11th lunar eclipse. And it finishes 10 days from the end with the solstice, the winter solstice coinciding with a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. So this year has got five outer planet conjunctions and five eclipses, right? I mean, that is already a lot because the outer planets move very slowly. And for those of you who were on AMPA or on AMPA chat, <clears throat> I, I think I sent an email which included a link to Richard Thomas where he, he talks about the other ones that are involved which, and, or, or kind of like the last time certain of these events happened, which is like hundred years ago and stuff like that. Um, but the other thing, the other thing is, so it's the, there are five outer planets. So, so the conjunctions, the first one is Saturn Pluto. The next one is Jupiter Pluto. Then Jupiter Pluto goes retrograde, and then Ju the next, the, mid the middle Jupiter Pluto conjunction happens actually at the midpoint of the calendar year on June the 30th, right? And then we get the, the final Jupiter-Pluto conjunction in November. We get another lunar e e eclipse in November, later in November, then a solar eclipse, and then the Jupiter-Saturn. So we've got a Saturn-Pluto conjunction, then Jupiter-Pluto, 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 then Jupiter-Saturn. So at the moment, all these outer planets, Pluto is what, how, I, don't know, I looked it up how, how many years ago. The Pluto period is about 248 years. Uranus is about 83 years. Uh, no, anyway, it is. Well, Jupiter is, is about 12 years. Saturn is 30 years. And um, we've got aspects from Uranus and Neptune as well. So that all those from Saturn out to Pluto are involved. So, the picture, so I just, I've got, I downloaded wonderful Astro East. Um, you can get free downloads of, you just put in a date and I'll give you this chart. Um, just for those of you who don't know, so this is, so here, 
is where, where Jupiter, Pluto and Saturn are really close together. And at the moment, they're in, a, they're in a square to Mars, but there's also Uranus here, and this has been going, those have been going in and out of a square there. And, but they've also, there's Neptune, and there's a sextile there. And that's, and then obviously various others, which, which vary through the year and are more fast moving. Uh, so this is, this is, yeah, this is very extraordinary. And the, the fact that it's, it's almost like a lens. Do you know what I mean? The fact that there's a certain kind of mirroring. And when I say, when I say 2020 vision, usually we think of 2020, 2020 vision is in retrospect. And my sense is that we're being called to vision more clearly, which is actually to do with co We need to vision what we want to co-create now uh, in, 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 the, in the deepest, most loving, highest way and, and to be open to that now in whatever way we can. Uh, I, that's, I think I, that's, I, I, know, I was looking for something that I did ages ago, which is more colourful, that I was going to end with, but because um, I haven't talked about thinking for being willing and other things I was going to, but I, so the only thing I could find which was I, I, something beautiful to end with was, um, I, mm. it, yeah, God be in my heart and in my thinking. And uh, that was a paper that I, I wrote for Anta um, some years ago. And, it, and, and it's just this, this absolutely beautiful. And this, this yeah, thinking of the heart by this guy, Gail Kulevint, who's a very interesting guy. And, uh, and the, this beautiful picture of the, the dove entering the heart. So, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm sorry I, 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 that I've taken up all this time and even then not said all the things I wanted to say, I think. He was like, should I talk about meaning and momentum? Yeah, no, see, energy, energy is a scalar, and momentum is a vector. And I think it's really interesting that energy was important in the MC school with relativity, and momentum is important in quantum mechanics, which is where David Bohm came into his realizations about the implicate order which led him on to add whiter and dialogue. So anyway, okay, so, so, um, Nicola, right, thank so, you. Yes, yeah, thank you all for your patience. <laughs> well, I, I, the, it, it's very interesting. And, um, I mean, while you've been talking, there's, there's been quite, um, uh, quite a lot of ideas exchanged on the chat. Yeah, um, another thing I've come up here for can't me. see it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, but, how, but could I, how could I get to see it? How could I get to see it? Well, I, I, I at the very least, I will send it around. Uh, when um, I'll send it around on the email, but there is a link there at the bottom of the screen somewhere. But but thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a perfect end to the week. Um, I do have. A, when did this last happen? When did this con this set of conjunctions last happen? What's the history? Uh, well, I mean, that's what I was trying to remember. I mean, it's, it, well, I mean, that said, that, that, right, Jupiter, Saturn, Jupiter, Pluto together, I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, like, sort of, there, there was something, like, elements of it, you know, like, like Saturn, Pluto, or, you know, happened, so, so Saturn, Pluto, because Saturn is 30 years, that happened 30 years ago, and Jupiter, would, would, there would have been one 12 years ago. But the fact of them all together, I can't remember now. That's why I said it was on this Richard Thomas video and I haven't looked that up. But we're talking, you know, sort of, the, the, there was some kind of ghastly, you know, yeah, I mean, there'd be, that I've got a feeling that the, I think you know, it might have been like the, like the 1918 Spanish flu thing had some, some elements of this. Okay. And then also some, something like in, in 18, something, whatever the, Crashes and uh, yeah, but I, I, I don't remember right. putting that down. Okay, um, but I, I, I'd like to open for questions. I, I personally found these ancient distinctions particularly powerful, and of course, distinctions are very powerful. So, um, and I think a lot of the discussion online has been about distinctions, 
and about how we distinguish things like consciousness and ego and so on. But um, yes, anybody got any questions? Uh, you can raise your hand or you can, Lou. If you were going to change the presentation or teaching of mathematics, how would you start? Oh, um, what I'm looking into is teaching mathematics through music more. Um, we've started a few kind of experiments with that, you know, really, really basic. Uh, but, but I think you know, there are more people who are interested, and I'm, I'm, this is something that I'm hoping that, you know, to kind of get more people. Anyway, so, but the, because the thing about teaching mathematics through music is that in music, we, we it's a group activity, we, we listen to each other. It's a communal activity. Whereas mm -hmm. the way that it's taught now, and increasingly, obviously, with computers and screens, it's this very sort of individual head down. Um, yes. Head up. And, and when we did geometry on the floor of the church <laughs> in Rollins Castle, it was a group activity. We had to we had to watch and listen to each other in order to bring it forth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, I, it's, it's so lovely. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, yeah, I, I've done that with a, some other groups now. <laughs> there was a hilarious one trying to do Desarc's theorem with a group. <laughs> yeah. But there are other things which are just so beautiful demonstrations, like one that you used to do about why minus infinity is plus infinity, because a line parallel to another line perturbed just slightly touches the plus infinity or the minus infinity, either way, right? Yes. So there, there are, one should collect things like that, that have that yeah. kind of insight. Yeah, because I, I wonder that, because it, it might be that like, in terms of geometry now, maybe it, it would be like going through projected geometry and topology before Euclidean. Like, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, like shapes of things. Um, you know, kind of like with topology, obviously bend, people are mm. having bend, you know, bendy things. Uh, Could you get closer to the microphone? We can hardly hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I know, I know I'm, I'll, I'll adjust here so I can kind of, is that, is that good? That's good. Okay. Yeah, and, and, we, and we can hear you better too, if you're closer. Oh, that, that's good, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a table to sit on here. No, because like, if I'm going to present, I need to, to move, I can't do it. Speaking of moving and different ways to do mathematics, I'm reminded that Aristotle was in the peripatetic school where they would uh, engage in dialogue and teach, but they'd be walking around continuously. And it reminds me of a situationalist um, activity called psychogeography, where they would move through the city in different patterns so that it would allow them to have different mind states. But it might be that we can think of doing mathematics as more of a kinetic activity. Mm. Um, I'm also oh, reminded of the quick also reminded of the yeah. quip that mathematics is applied music which is something to think about. Um, there's some wonderful musical educational techniques which involve so Dalcro's um, Nick I don't know if you know about Dalcro's technique for teaching music. No. Okay I'll, I'll put it in the chat it's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah yeah no. Well, it's like it's that, that's you know the band Eurythmics that's where they got it from. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> Eurythmy, you know, because that's a, like a Steiner movement thing, mm. and uh, that is very powerful. And it, I mean, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I did, was, was doing some just um, like a few weeks ago with a teacher where, where we were just looking at. I mean, you you really slow down, and you're sensing, and, and just this thing of uh, moving, taking like to move your hand down like that or up like that, if you can sense the difference. And, and I actually say, I mean, I think that might relate also to what you were saying, Laurie, about the psych psychogeography, because there is also, there's, there's, there's something called emotional geography now, isn't there? Um, yeah, 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 they have conferences. <laughs> I, I met somebody, this was like 10 years ago, I was thinking, wow. Um, so, uh, and this is yes. Yeah, so, so this is again my thing about the, the Buberian or the the um, getting to know you way of re relating, mm -hmm. you know, of of learning. And speaking of relating um, and eurythmics, you you being together and rhythmics being you know rhythms or, or patterns and periods. Um, 
uh, earlier um, you were talking about tight words for knowledge and I, uh, I thought what we're doing today is um, co cognoscience, you know, it's uh, coming to gnosis together. Yes. You know, with cognoscienti without the sociological implications, but just as people that yeah. are um, in engaging in gnosis as a participatory act rather than a solitary pursuit. Yeah. It's quite interesting. To, yeah, to I, I agree. Quite keep the mutuality in it rather than this didactic or scholastic um, some people passively absorb and one person projects out which has been a bit too common. Yeah, yeah. No, that's another thing that's happened in, in mathematics. It was initially, uh, the, the, yeah, the Greek term was deknumi, which means demonstration. And up until the 19th century, and even a little bit into the 20th century, you, you know, you when you were what we now say proving something you would you were demonstrating it it was the demonstration of qed quadrat demonstrandum but at some point people started talking about proofs and that is a whole different you, you brought the status thing in then you know this is the proof yeah da, 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 I'm, uh, uh, excuse me i i'm not sure i understand what you're saying there proof proof always for in practice amounts to figuring out how to get from point A to point B by, by making some reasoning. And, yeah. and, and what happened uh, in the 20th century is that people had the idea of formalizing proofs in formal systems. Yeah. But, but when anybody is actually proving in practice, they may or may not be working in a, in a specific formal system. They have to just go ahead and find their way. You know. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, in terms of what mathematicians do among, amongst themselves, I'd like to say amongst ourselves, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm too Pythagorean. Uh, anyway, is this, yeah, as you say, it, it, it's working things out and, and uh, you know, as we know, um, oh, what's, what was his name, the, the Andrew Wiles, you know, his, his first proof um, of Fairmont, amazing. Um, you know, had flaws in it, and, and they were shown, and he went away, went, and managed to patch it up, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. and, and, and to this <laughs> day, to this day, people yeah. still argue about exactly in what formal system did he make that proof, because it's an Oh, really? Proof. Oh, I didn't did know Did he that. use Grothendieck universes or not? You can <laughs> find these discussions on the web. Oh, right. wow. Because mathematicians, oh, well, mathematicians just use what they have, and get from point A to point yeah. B. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, John Torday. I have a simple question about astrology. Sorry. Here. Uh, is, is John Torday next? And, uh, can, oh, okay. who, who was that? I'm trying to find John Torday. Oh, I was, it was Doug asking. But oh, Doug. I, sorry, Doug. So John's first and then, then you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. So thank you, Nicola, for that pre presentation. I thought it was remarkable. And um, as I said the other day, I think that we make a systematic error in focusing on material as opposed to energy. And I think that's, in my mind, that's what you're talking about. But um, one thing you said about uh, consciousness that I thought was interesting in, in contrast to Krishnamurti's take on con consciousness is that ego gets in the way of our consciousness connecting with the consciousness of the cosmos. And I think that's true, not for the same reason he does. I think our physiology, as I will allude to on uh, next Tuesday is a manifestation of the cosmos. So that's where that those two interface. But I did want to mention uh, in the context of physical effects on our physiology, I used to run a clinical lab at the at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, where we uh, provided service to women coming into preterm labor uh, spontaneously. And you could see the ebb and flow of the moon in the, uh, the, the frequency of these uh, deliveries. So it's clear to me that the separation of the moon from the earth uh, lunar effect is, is alive and well. And for example, that Jupiter Saturn thing, I mean, we know that the environment is constantly changing and we in turn have to evolve in, in order to adapt. That's the whole point of ev evolution. So I would not uh, dismiss the idea that uh, the Saturn um, uh, uh, Jupiter thing, those are gravity waves. I've, I've done experimentation showing them zero gravity or near zero gravity disconnects biology from, from its orientation to the cosmos. Um, so it's, it's a real thing. And others have shown it as well. Yeah. So. Thanks, John. Nicola, do you want to respond to that? Uh, 
Yeah, well, yeah. I was just thinking about this, yeah, this zero gravity thing. Of, yeah, because I remember I just heard something recently about that that, that problematic for the, the idea of astronauts. Um, right. Yeah. But they've shown it in yeast as well. I've shown it in lung and bone cells, isolated. And I honestly, I, th I think that the reason for that is because the unicellular state has a cytoskeleton and that cytoskeleton determines the, the, the status of the cell, whether it's homeostatic or mitotic or meiotic. I think that in the use of Gouldian exaptation, what does that reference? It references the singularity that occurred before the Big Bang or some cataclysmic event that set all of this, all of the cosmos and us into motion. So I think that there are actually scientifically demonstrable relationships that would uh, uh, support that idea. No, oh, there was, no, what was I thinking as you were talking? Um, oh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, I've been thinking about the um, societal embryology, because I'm a, as, as well as, as doing maths, I'm a craniosacral therapist, and, and, and because of that, I also uh, uh, studied some, you know, obviously anatomy and physiology and, and some biochemistry as well. And, uh, and that, yes, yeah, so, so going back to this the thing about the, the term consciousness or awareness, um, I think the thing, yes, yeah, so if one thinks of the embryo state, it, it's clear that it's clear that there is intelligence. I, I had a friend who used to say, look, you know, that you, you start as one cell and then look what happens. So you, you say you've got intelligence. What makes you think that this one cell doesn't have intelligence? And, and hey, hang about, have a look. Your body has got billions of cells. Hey, do you think that they are less intelligent, right? right. So, um, oh, and yeah, now somebody was mentioning when um, John Conway came to Cambridge and the proof, <laughs> Demonstration. The free will theorem. The free will theorem. That's right. That 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 if we have free will, then um, then so do electrons. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've, I've suggested that there's a homology between the cell and the atom. Yeah. If you think about the Pauli exclusion principle, it's both deterministic and probab probabilistic. And I've also uh, proposed that the first principles of the cell negative entropy, chemiosmosis, homeostasis, those are also, they also, the first two, negative entropy and um, chemiosmosis are deterministic. Homeostasis is probabilistic. So that, that's why we exist in that gray zone between those two boundaries. Say that again, chemiostasis oh, is, de uh, is deterministic. So, which, so which is, yeah. there, are, there are three fir first principles of physiology that, uh, of the right. cell which I actually yeah. determined experimentally by working, I'm a lung biologist, so I work backwards from a lung to the unicellular right. state, step by step, more or less, with a little, some gaps in between, because we don't do that kind of science. But I had concluded that there were only three, three first principles necessary for the cell to exist. Uh, negative entropy, that's Schrodinger. Um, chemiosmosis, which is the simplest form of bioenergetics to support a negative entropic state. And then you have homeostasis that holds everything together. And that actually, uh -huh. in my opinion, homeostasis was the consequence of the, cat, the Big Bang. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So every balanced equation represents homeostatic control, whether it's e equals FC squared or sodium plus chlorine equals sodium chloride or the endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm making a, an offspring. It's the same thing. Uh, Mark, may I? Yeah, I, um, it's Doug first and then um, Dino. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Doug. John. It's a, it's a, yes, it's a good thank question you, about 12. 12 seems like it looks like a constant shows up all over, like 12 dozen eggs, you know, 12 parts of the uh, astrology, you know. And the question is, is 12 just completely man-made or is it really a constant of nature? And it turns out there's one place, if you take a high dimensional space of a unit cube, and you randomly pick points in there, all of those random points will be the square root of 12 over n, the square root of n over 12 away from each other from the midpoint. And so 12 shows up there as an actual constant with 12 in it, and it's the distance between the midpoint of the space and randomly generated points in the space. So if the space has actually 12 dimensions in it, 
the radius of random points to the center point is exactly one. So how's that for an idea for 12? But where else does it show up in any kind of number theory or is it just a man-made thing about 12? We have a whole bunch of notes on the side about 12. Uh, the, yeah, some I, of the I, most I, cogent I, ones I, being I, that 12, 12 is related to the dodec. Okay, yeah. But, yeah, sure. But it shows up in this randomly generated radius. Is a, you know, is, has an exact constant of 12. It shows up in Mathematica. So, so is there any other place where it shows up as a constant? And why do humans keep using 12, 12 dozen eggs, and, you know, 12... Signs of the zodiac. Ending music. Twelve inches in a foot. I mean, you know, you go on and on where twelve shows up. Yeah. As Vanessa just said, some have proposed that the universe, geometric universe as a whole, is the collapsing of a dodecahedron to itself, self-referentially. Oh. Right. Oh, okay, that's but interesting. Doesn't tell, doesn't About tell. twelve. Um, um, Mark, Mark, Mark. 24, which is the number of droplets on the crown of a milk drop. Was that, Anton? Say that uh, again. There are 24 droplets on the crown of a milk drop. If you have a milk drop experiment where you drop milk onto a surface or into a liquid, uh, then when it sort of uh, comes up on the sides, it forms a crown and there are 24 little droplets. Interesting. <laughs> There's uh, Euler's supposed proof that the sum of all the integers put together is minus 1 over 12. <laughs> and it's not a meaningless proof that it's, uh, it has some validity in mathematics, even oh, though really? it's be hope. Huh. Okay. Well, there's two natural reasons for 12. One of them is that there are 12 lunar months in a solar year, and I understand that's approximation. And the other one is that it's so easy to count to 12 on your fingers. So, uh, oh, I'll get my hand on the screen. Only if you have six fingers in your hand. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Using your thumb as a pointer, you have 12 little bones on your fingers that you can reach. So I've always believed that that's the real reason for dozen and gross, which is 12 dozen, and for um, pence and a shilling. And all these other things, I think, are very nice mathematical concepts, but I don't believe they're why 12 is fundamental in our language. Okay. Uh, here's here's one that I just uh, got from this book. This is useful for dealing with people's birthdays. You can uh, look up <laughs> lore about the small numbers. Yeah. And um, they point out that 12 is the kissing number in three dimension for spheres. That means that you can, you know, kissing means just touching tangentially. You can put 12 three-dimensional balls together, touching three of them, uh, each touching the others. One, uh, but, uh, but you can't do 13. And the history is, apparently the possibility of a 13th sphere arose in a conversation between Isaac Newton and Scottish astronomer David Gregory back in 1694. Uh, and Newton was on the 12 side and Gregory was on the 13th side, but it got resolved to 12 by 1953. Interesting. So 12 is a characterizing number of three dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And you all know what the Anu is, right? The, that the Anu is the article that are the from Theosophical Society, and they it has only ten strands in it though. So is that related to string theory? <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah. Dean Dino has been very patient. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, may I? Yes. Oh, uh, so I, I I wanted to 
uh, ask uh, Nicola uh, about uh, going back to P uh, Pythagoras and uh, uh, when uh, uh, you uh, talked about uh, um, the etymology of philosophy uh, coming from uh, uh, philia, uh, which is a kind of, uh, of love. Uh, you distinguished uh, three kinds of love, uh, philia, uh, agape, and uh, uh, eros. And then uh, you said that uh, um, uh, Plato is very much on the Eros, uh, in, uh, meaning uh, the sexual uh, manifestation of uh, love. Well, I, I'm not uh, completely in agreement with that, because uh, Cicero says that uh, the uh, philosophy w was not uh, a term as we use it now, uh, in general, for all philosophical school. Uh, Cicero said that the philosophy was the name of the school of Plato. And uh, uh, in the Platonic uh, tradition, you know, Iamblichus uh, is the one who wrote uh, the life of, of Pythagoras. So, uh, 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 Pythagorism is very important for the school uh, of, uh, for the Platonic school. There is n uh, not uh, uh, an opposition, uh, on the contrary. No, no. Uh, historically, no. I think that uh, they converge. And uh, I, I, I just wanted to uh, recall one thing, uh, because there has been uh, in, the, uh, in the chat and in the debate afterwards uh, m m very much talk about consciousness. But uh, there is something more uh, than uh, uh, consciousness in, uh, psych in psychic uh, activity. There is something which goes on in psychic activity, which uh, uh, we are not aware of. So, and, and, and in, uh, in Plato and in the later Platonic tradition, this is a very important element. For instance, in the Karmis, uh, Plato talks about one uh, mythical character who, uh, according to some people, was a, a slave of Pythagoras and uh, according to other was a teacher of Pythagoras and uh, Plato uh, talks about cure and if you have to cure a, a, a finger you, you have to cure the, uh, the hand and so on uh, the, and uh, the, the whole body and uh, from the whole body goes up to, 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 to soul and what does cure soul? He uh, refers to this uh, uh, a, a mythical character who was uh, uh, in a way or a teacher of uh, Pythagoras or a member of Pythagorean school, Zalmoxis, who said that fine, there are fine words that cure, uh, sort of charms, sort of enchantments, something which reminds the therapeutical dialogue and there has been uh, studies on uh, the similarity between Socratic dialogue and, uh, and uh, therapeutic dialogues uh, uh, now, uh, be, uh, because, uh, which are uh, based on a, a relation of empathy. And uh, Plato says that uh, uh, the, uh, the effect of the words, the, the fine words that cure, the charms, the enchantments that cure, is uh, uh, sophrosine in Greek, which is translated as moderation, temperance. I, uh, I would call it uh, uh, in the Latin sense, uh, prudence. Prudence in the Latin sense and in the way it was used by uh, 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 people in the Renaissance, uh, humanists in the Renaissance, uh, uh, prudence meant uh, not cautiousness, but being uh, uh, able to uh, 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 behave properly in a, in a certain situation. That's prudence. 
how to know how to behave in a given situation, not not just consciousness and escaping from uh, from a, a danger which is perceivable. So this uh, sophrosine which you achieve with uh, uh, through uh, fine words that cure was called sophrosine. So uh, kind of. Uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned control, we shouldn't control too much, but in this sense, to be able to manage your emotional reactions, knowing what's going on even unconsciously in, in your psychic uh, activity is the result of the cure, of a therapeutic cure uh, by words, through words. So, no, that's, uh, I think, a, an important aspect of uh, Pythagoreanism that uh, should be taken into account. Nicola. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't want to diss Plato totally. And, and, and certainly, yeah, no, I mean, he continued a lot of Pythagoreanism. I mean, clearly, the whole, yeah, the dodecahedron, all this kind of stuff. But that's very, very interesting. And when I was saying about control, what I was talking about was the desire to control the outside. What, yeah, I'm, yeah. what, I'm, what I'm actually, what, I'm, what I think, that is, yes, the whole element of Pythagoras, and it was to some extent in Plato as well. Well, I mean, obviously Socrates, know thyself, is to do with how do we control, you know, how, you know what's going on? Um, you know, how do we get to know? Um, I, this, there was this really, listen, I don't know if you know this guy, um, uh, Hugh of Balmer. It, this was um, from uh, this guy, Harold Balbach, a lovely guy. Um, so there were, you know, within the scholastics, there, you know, there was that beginning of the science of interior knowledge as well. And that is, I, I think, exactly, you know, I mean, now we've, we've got, you know, questions of mindfulness and et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's the beginning of I suppose it's probably, I mean, since Freud and Jung, isn't it? That this thing of, well, look, you know, what, what's happening inside. Um, but that's very, I haven't, that, that's really interesting. Sophrosina, and they were, this was an, an, an incantation. I didn't know about that. This is very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? I just had a thought based on Lou's observation that um, negative and positive infinity um, coalesce. I don't mind. Somebody just asked. Uh, so I just posted saying that three, four, five are the simplest form of the, Pythagor the Pythagorean theorem. It adds up to 12. So maybe, Nicola, you can address that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, yeah, the Pythagoras theorem is. Uh, is I think one of the, yeah, I mean, in fact, <laughs> Pythagoras theorem for me is about, it's like Fermat's last theorem for Andrew Wiles, i.e. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's what is, the, what is the, the true deep meaning of that? And, and it's, it is, and it's in that archetype, the fact, because, you know, so what we've done, you know, with algebra, and that's it, you know, we generalize and, it, it, you know, so we've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared, yeah, 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 you know, da, da. and the, but obviously it's interesting because we get the Pythagorean triples, etc., etc. but the fact that the first one, it, it's, a, it's a bit like you were saying, Doug, about, um, you know, that, 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 that there's a the randomly generated radius has, the, is this root n over 12. It's, it's the fact of this extraordinary, you know, it's the, it's the first three integers after two, you know, consecutive integers that generate this right angle triangle. So in other words, it's speaking about our space, it's speaking about our incarnate space. And in projective geometry, similarly, you've got certain integers that come out. And this is, I mean, again, this is in a way what I'm thinking about in terms of arithmology is num you know, that th there are various places where numbers come out. I mean, this is, you know, obviously like Riemann, you know, sort of like kind of, wow. 
there, there are places where integers occur. I mean, actually, of course, it was, <laughs> it was what started the CH, and I think probably why Clive thought I was on the same page, which I wasn't really. Uh, but there are you know, places where these integers come out, and it's, and it's actually having a feel for these integers, which you see, for me, uh, yeah, you see, I, I, I live in a world of beings, so ideas are beings, are, you know, living beings, and so numbers are, are, are living beings that, that, that we are attempting to get to know in different ways, and by they have these different characteristics. Uh, but I, I'm, the thing is, I'm also interested in nature spirits, and you know, but I, I, as far as I'm concerned, we live in this, this hugely heterogeneous universe which we have, which we have, we, we mostly, we, we walk around in barcodes most of the time. This is what we think about consciousness kills, because as soon as we create concepts, you know, I don't know, there was some famous person who said, you know, that the, 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 the first time a child, you know, Sees a bird and sees a pigeon and is told that's the pigeon. That's the, that's the, that's the last time the child sees the pigeon, because it's got that name then. And when it, so when it sees it again, it's, oh, oh, there's a pigeon. And that's what we do. I, I I like I like looking upside down at things because just to get you know to, to be able to kind of see things fresh. The problem um, is not in the naming. The problem is in the social conditioning that has us holding on to the names before the uh, experiences. Well, no, yeah, we, it is, we, we need to name, but, but, but it's, well, the social condition, I mean, that, that is, that goes along with it, because that's why we learn the names, because when we learn the names, that, that's how we get by. In yes, the but we are the creators of names. And yeah, yeah, when we yeah. take the position of being creators of names, then we can also be the releasers of names. We can, but it's... We but must. Think we yeah. we do not have a choice. The, the condition well, we, either, the we either take the stance of being the creators and the releasers of names, or we are the robots. Yeah, oh, yeah that's another whole thing that we, we didn't come on to, because like, this whole kind of AI thing. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to use that metaphor. Right. If language is a tool, and you and you use terminology it, uh, that defines that language, it constrains. It's not a me It's not a means to an end. It becomes a, an end in itself. Isn't that the problem? Isn't that what you're talking about, Nicola? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> we get trapped. You know, we get trapped in our in our own creations. I mean, the names are like a map that we draw on top of the phenomena to help us understand mm -hmm. it. But in drawing that map, we pin it down. Lou is suggesting we have equally the power to take down that map and observe yes, the territory we again afresh. Well, we do. We but do. How to learn to do that, but, to undo uh, that naming but, instinctively. Exactly. Poetry does that. Yeah, poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I and, mean, and, I think it's, we're, 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 conf we're constraining ourselves in materialism and not releasing ourselves in terms of energy flow. That's the problem with, with determining, with naming things. They become material, yeah. sort of energetic. You lose the verb. <laughs> the verb doesn't yeah. have any meaning anymore because it's, uh, everything's focusing on the noun. And the yeah. 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 Uh, OK, I, I, Peter, Marcia, did you have a question? Uh, well, I, I wanted to go back to uh, uh, the question of awareness and uh, uh, what uh, Peter Rollins and I have called sentience. Uh, were you all aware, for example, that um, uh, birds, for example, uh, or some birds, uh, could be said to be aware or sentient of the Earth's magnetic field? Because it's been actually proven that they have evolved, sen they have evolved cells in their sense organs that are able to detect the Earth's magnetic field. And so that when they're flying over the Sahara, uh, they fly at night and use, use the magnetic field 
as uh, as uh, 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 as we use a GPS system. Indeed, I'm told that in fact, uh, because the GPS systems that we have are so vulnerable to military attack, that um, that uh, the military are now going back to using. Um, uh, the Earth's magnetic field as a, a, as a means for navigation rather than a GPS system. Oh, that's really it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. No, I didn't know that about the birds. It makes sense, obviously. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think this has been, yeah, this has been really, really rich. I mean, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, and I'll be, I'll be really interested to see what's come up in the chat. Because I was just, you know, I've only just... Yeah, I'll, I'll send it around. It's been brilliant, the chat uh, yeah, today, yeah. so... And, um, I mean, I've made some notes. Uh, yeah, because I realise I don't have some people's individual emails. And so, for example, I... I'd like to know, you know, like follow things through that, that you were saying, John Torde, and, and that you were saying, Doug Matchka. So I don't know if, is there, is there a way of putting people's emails on as well? Or, or, can, or can you send, could, can, could you send? Um, if people aren't on the AMPA chat, um, I'm, I'm not sure. If, if people aren't on the AMPA chat, what can you do? We you write can... our emails in this chat and you publish it after the talk, then everyone will be able to see it. Oh, no, but then they won't. If we write our emails in this chat and you publish it... Yes, then... that would work very lovely. Yes, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. I'll, I'll just send this chat round with the um, video. Okie dokie. So, okay, so... Okay. I, th I think we should stop. Um, yeah, that's me. That, I mean, thank you ever so much. Um, Nicola, it's 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 been a perfect end to the week, really, in many ways, and um, it just uh, illustrates the breadth and depth of AMPA and the discussions that we've been having this week. And um, I'm looking forward to next week. I am aware that obviously um, the time is always going to be a going to be a problem. Now we have chosen a time that's convenient for people in the UK. Uh, 5 p.m. but that is also a problem for people in the states sometimes because it cuts into the middle of the day. <laughs> now I don't I don't propose to change this next week but if you do have strong feelings and a couple of people have have mentioned uh, um, possibilities about shifting this around I, th I think maybe we should experiment with um, uh, playing with the time so it, it's up to you but um, but I, I mean, just speaking personally, this, this is, this is, I, I think this is wonderful. I really think it's wonderful. So, and I'm, I'm so happy that everyone's here. And, um, and in many ways, I, I wonder if we're listening to each other and tuning into each other better for the fact that we're doing it in this way. We're, we're taking so much time in care. Um, so, uh, uh, next week we've got Grenville on Monday. Grenville, are you there? No. Just hold on. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to say uh, quickly something about what you're going to say on talk about on Monday? Uh, yeah. Well, first, first of all, I excuse, apologise for the uh, dude woman behind my head. That's the uh, painting. I we can't got see it, but now I'm looking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I, I've discovered. In the last month, I got myself a new mobile phone, and uh, it appears to be working very well. So I'm, I'm going to use that technology to uh, do my talk. Um, uh, uh, thanks, everyone, so far. I'm sorry I, I missed Dino's talk yesterday because, uh, unfortunately, I still have I still have to work, and I did a 12 and a half hour working day yesterday. Uh, what I'm going to do on Monday uh, is um, pull together uh, last year's presentation along with. Uh, the uh, which I did at Liverpool, together with a second presentation that I did um, with um, at, at Pampa, uh, and pull that together with other learning.
that's taken place prior to publication of my main papers, uh, which occurred uh, earlier this year. So it, it's going to be another talk about bioentropy, but uh, I, I do have a reasonably complete but very small theory of uh, periodic numbers. And uh, the mathematics is pretty straightforward. Um, I think you'll find it uh, interesting. Uh, it's uh, 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 over the centuries, there have been many questions about prime numbers. And uh, you know, by virtue of my delving around with um, the binary derivative, I seem to have discovered some deep secrets about uh, the way numbers behave. And so I'm only beginning to come to terms with what it is that I've done. Um, and um, look forward to uh, uh, you, your feedback. Um, yeah. I'm going to try and do it um, uh, like Nicola did, um, okay. so that it's not just a uh, death by PowerPoint. So I'll be working that, on that over the uh, over the weekend. Great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, um, and would like to wish everybody a nice weekend, and see you on Monday. Yeah. I'll, send, I'll send the video around. Okay. All right. Thank Take you. care, folks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.